psychedelics for the last decade for Rolling Stone, Vice, and a number of other publications, and more recently founded Double Blind, which is a magazine that's on bookshelves across the country, and also um, you can find us online. Um, and uh, we have our esteemed panelist here, Jay Clefham, is a mycologist. We have Leonard Larer, who is the founder of Back of the Arts Algae Sciences, and then Tony Molesky, also a mycologist for that same company. Um, before we dive in and talk about um, the challenges to scaling the production of psilocybin, I just want to give a little bit of context. I don't know um, how much everybody knows. I think there's a, a wide variety of familiarity with the psychedelic space in this room. So, um, in May, or excuse me, in November of 2018, Compass Pathways, which is a uh, pharmaceutical company based out of the UK, was granted breakthrough therapy status for psilocybin for treatment resistant depression. And then in November of this year, USONA, which is a nonprofit pharmaceutical company based here in the United States, was also granted a breakthrough therapy status by the FDA for psilocybin for major depressive disorder, which is affecting. 6.7% of Americans, so it's a massive mental health epidemic that we're facing with depression. Um, and so breakthrough therapy status basically means we are designating this as a breakthrough therapy because there are no other medicines that are effectively treating this condition right now. Treatment resistant, you all know, means you know we've tried what's available, it hasn't worked. There's more than 100 million people around the globe with treatment resistant depression. Um, so alongside sort of all of the all of the excitement around psilocybin and following in the footsteps of cannabis, and um, there has been the rise of a grassroots movement to decriminalize psilocybin at the local level. So last year in May, the county of Denver decriminalized psilocybin, which it's not legalization. It basically means it's a low enforcement priority for law enforcement in the city. And then less than a month later, Oakland decriminalized all naturally occurring psychedelics. So that includes psilocybin, peyote, ayahuasca, San Pedro, anything that comes from the earth. So not LSD or MDMA or any other synthetic derivative of the psychedelic. Now there's more than 100 cities and counties across the United States that are trying to decriminalize naturally occurring psychedelics. So there is a massive movement. It is spreading like wildfire, and it's really two things are happening at the same time. We have the cities and counties that are trying to decriminalize psychedelics at the local level, and the reason why this has implications for investors and people who are interested in getting into this space is because a lot of the people who are running these initiatives are doing so in the hopes that people are gonna be empowered to grow psilocybin and other naturally occurring psychedelics basically in their homes, um, which means that they won't have to get it as an FDA-approved medication. Um, and then the federal research, which is progressing. Hi, Andrew. Um, anyway, so there's a little bit of context for you. Um, and uh, now we'll just dive into our panel. Um, I'd like to start with, with Leonard, will you talk to us? Just give us a little bit of context as to what you're doing and what the implications are for the psychedelic space. What we talk about are the real nuts and bolts, like it took uh, Amgen 15 years before they could get, uh, get a, a, a reasonable drug uh, and, and, and start the whole antibody, whole antibody therapeutics. And so what, we, what we're really talking about is how do you get a safe, sustainable CGMP, uh, good laboratory practice supply of uh, not only psilocybin, but all entheogens onto the market. We're not only talking here about psilocybin, psilocybin, we're also talking about a whole range of, uh, of, of, of products which are derived from cacti, are derived from, from, from even frog uh, epithelium. And we think we can do it because we do it already. Um, uh, but it's a long and hard and tough road. It's also a road which requires a huge amount of investment. We just installed now our own uh, brand new HPLC, we have CMS, which is mass spectrometry. Uh, and what we basically work on is one thing, sustainable cellular agriculture. In other words, there's no way on this planet that regulators are going to uh, approve uh, a drug which is grown on shit, with all respect. Okay? 
got to we got to move on. We're not into genetic modification. We're into basically helping nature do things better, and we've done that already. Our main product is this, which is an extract of spirulina. It's called Phytocyanin. Has anybody heard of it? No. Okay. Yep. Okay. Good. You can get some for me afterwards. Okay. This is a potent <laughs> antioxidant, and uh, it comes from a blue green algae. And we're the first in the world to basically make this in a non-polluting, sustainable way. And it goes basically in, in, into the market as a food colorant. But we've been testing it quite extensively for depression, believe it or not, in animal studies. And we found, actually found that it wasn't an antidepressant, but we learned a lot about how to do animal studies. And all our extracts, which we're, going to, which we're doing now, uh, which we may be doing or may not be doing, in the epigenetic space, will go through a similar development process of animal testing, which is vitally important if we can ever distinguish between, between what is it, what is it, and why do these things do what they do. So, number one, uh, we are basically cellular agriculture specialists. We have one of the largest facilities of, uh, uh, of robotic cell culture in the world, but nobody knows about it because our work is basically around algae, algae extracts, using these as mitogens to improve growth. And now more increasingly, what we found is that the, and we can't obviously talk about this in any great detail, is that it is possible to increase the levels of actin in things like wasabi, uh, uh, which, uh, and perhaps, uh, perhaps hallucinogenic mushrooms in, in cell culture to a level where it makes it, in, it, makes it economically viable never to grow a mushroom again. Never, never to have a mushroom growing on, on manure, cow dung, uh, uh, horse shit, whatever it is, <laughs> again. And that's the future, future of this. So basically, that, that's, that's our work. Uh, I, I, I don't want to go into too much detail. And I have on either side of me our principal mycologists, who basically are the ones that push, that, that opened my eyes to this whole area and pushed me so hard in the direction of we've got to be able to do this in a way that you can get universal access to what, what are definitely uh, active molecules that work. They're, they're, well, well, I think we're amongst the converted, but it should be easy to convert everybody else. So, over to my guy. Yeah, Tony or uh, Jay, will you talk to us a little bit about, you know, what what is the psilocybin that, that people are using now in the trials at NYU and Hopkins and others, and how do what you're doing uh, differ? The difference with what they're doing, they're, we're just, our basic principle of trying to make the cleanest possible cultures of active compounds. And I'm not sure exactly with John Hopkins or what their, <coughs> their actual test, what they're getting to test them with. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that, but we're trying to, to fill that food chain. Whereas I know for a fact that there's multiple compounds that are lost through the drying process and multiple compounds that just aren't explored, like THCV. There's all these compounds that they're now like finding out that complete the, what really makes THC work is the cannabis. And we're trying to get all of those compounds brought out and isolated and figured out for what they're worth so that then they can really understand is it psilocin or is it something else? I'm sorry, is it psilocin or is it something else that they're trying, that, that is causing this? You know, what are, what are the results from, truly? Is it the psilocin in the mushroom? Is there other compounds in the mushroom that the results are coming from? And we are trying to dissect all of that and figure it out so that we know where these, you know, what points these are on this, and this HPLC issue, what these points really truly mean to the mind and to the soul. And that's our goal is to have that laid out like a diagram. Yeah, that's very interesting um, for those of you who are in the cannabis space who are familiar with the fact that um, there's this movement right now to isolate the terpenes and the cannabinoids to figure out exactly what combinations of what things work for what people and what conditions. Um, there's more than uh, 200 mushrooms that have psilocybin in them, 200 strains. Um, so Jay, can you talk to me a little bit about, you know, all the different kinds of mushrooms with psilocybin and 
Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. There's, uh, there's how your work uh, is going to help you navigate that? So we, we spent the past couple of years uh, collecting various strains of mushrooms um, that are psilocybin producing mushrooms. <coughs> of some of those strains, uh, a couple produce higher ratios of psilocin to psilocybin. And the psilocin is the part that ends up being oxidized and degraded during the drying process. And um, we're, you know, in looking for all these different varieties of mushrooms, we're looking for the mushrooms that produce higher ratios of psilocin and then growing it in a way that it can be processed without degrading any of those aspects. I'm just going to turn to my right here. Lauren Reddick was running a little bit late, but she just joined us. She's a partner at Pillar PC. And um, so a lot of people are looking at psilocybin and psychedelics, and they're saying, it's following in the footsteps of cannabis, and oh gosh, i got to get in right now. Like, what, what, what are your thoughts? Is it too soon? Is, are people right on time? And, and what kinds of uh, lessons do people learn from the, in, the cannabis investment landscape as they're entering into the psychedelic space? Thank you, I apologize for being late. I am filling in for a partner of mine, David Feldman, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, I do a lot of cannabis law, and we're just starting out to get into this, and it is similar in a lot of ways and different in a lot of ways, but <coughs> the most important thing to think about whenever you're investing is that this is a long-term play. If you're in it for the right reasons, you're not in it to get rich quick, and I think that that was a big problem that the cannabis industry had in capitalizing. It was presented as a green rush. Um, and if anyone who knows anything about investing in cannabis, it's incredibly green rush, uh, especially for the operator. <coughs> but there are a lot of similarities and, and um, dissimilarities. Um, as, people, as everyone probably knows, in here, both cannabis and mushrooms and psychedelics are Schedule One drugs. Um, and that means, according to a recent World Substances Act, uh, they have no medical purpose. We know that's not true. Uh, that they can't be used safely. We know that's not true. And they're highly susceptible to abuse. We know that's not true. So both cannabis and psychedelics really have no place in Schedule One, but they are classified as Schedule One. Now, the reasons for that classification, for those of you who know about the legalization of cannabis, is really rooted in immigration animosity. We know that the Controlled Substances Act was ushered through the Nixon administration in an effort to suppress political rights um, for minorities, um, to include key strikes for those who, um, who contested the, the, the current Nixon administration and the war in Vietnam in particular. So we have mass incarceration, we have mass arrest, and we have issues in cannabis that we don't have in the uh, psychedelic universe. Uh, so the legalization efforts in cannabis, independent from medical cannabis, are rooted in social justice reform, ending mass incarceration, you know, fixing the, the failed war on drugs and the collateral consequences associated with anyone who was improperly arrested in connection with the failed war on drugs. Um, the, the legalization of mushrooms and of psychedelics is rooted really in a connection to nature. Um, and if anyone takes a look at, you know, for example, the legalization, of, I shouldn't say legalization, the decriminalization measure passed in Oakland, um, it, it reads sort of like a groovy diet to getting high, and it talks a lot about the spiritual connection with planet Earth um, and, and people having the freedom to alter their minds, and that's really not something that the government should be able to jail people for. So the, the reasons and the policies underlying the legalization of both substances are similar and dissimilar in various respects. Uh, but we are nonetheless stepping into a multi-billion dollar demand when we think about the medical potential for mushrooms covering large swaths of the population, similarly as you would with some of many of the medical conditions that medical cannabis addresses. Um, I'm going to turn to Lauren Reddick, who's going to talk a little bit about cannabis. Um, Can you talk to me a little bit about your relationship with King's College London? As I mentioned, the uh, uh, development of, of, of the of, of this product, phytocyanin. Okay. The uh, development. Uh, I hate hearing my own voice. Uh, <laughs> uh, the development of, the, of of phytocyanin, which is an extract of a blue green algae called spirulina. You have heard of spirulina, of course. So, um, it basically. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, the, 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 the idea was that we thought that it was a potential antidepressant. So these are botanical drugs. So what you do is you do a whole range of animal studies. You make mice depressed very cruelly, and you see if they feel better, but you give them some of the stuff. 
We didn't work, but it turned out that this particular product, because of its potent antioxidant, uh, is basically the world's next natural Gatorade. Which uh, we don't believe you, but that's fine. Uh, and so our our our, our ideas, we will be we will be working together with Hadassah Brain Lab, which is the the the, 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 the world leaders in animal models of psychiatric conditions, uh, on 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 these various extracts, on the natural extracts. Once we see that there's some aspects of the natural extract which we know there will be, we'll start to dissect out the particular active molecules. Uh, and we're investing more and more in, in, in our own analytical capacity for this. And remember, all this is coming from cell, cellular agriculture. It's not coming from a mushroom. And we're in some kind of legal penumbra, which is gonna co cost us a shitload of money to, to sort out, you know. I don't, I don't want my PhD to be arrested and, and all that kind of stuff. So it, it is, we're, we're living in this penumbra. And our whole goal with our R&D is to get out of this darn penumbra. And if you don't believe me, this is a penumbra, go to your sonar site, go to every clinical trial site. And there's this thing, we get mushrooms from X, Y, Z, and then there's a big dark hole. And then the next thing, those mushrooms are being given to patients. That's not the way you do uh, biomedical R&D. I'm an epidemiologist, I'm a biostatistician. You document every single thing uh, that, that you do. And that's what, what, what our goal is, to get this out of the penumbra. We can, and, and the first thing we can do is, is, is torture some poor animals because uh, that at least uh, is, is on the edge of the penumbra. We can be quite open, we can publish, we can publish that, we can get the relevant permissions. This work is being done in the context of a collaboration between Hadassah Brain Lab and King's College. Uh, and uh, we are actually having a meeting in 10 days time at King's College to start outlining the, this particular uh, line, of li line of research. Uh, but it's not, it, it is pre-clinical research. And I think it's vitally important that we go down this road, step by step by step by step. Or else you get into the same thing with cannabis at the end of the day, General American Medical Association publishes CBD, no good. Two, three days later, cannabis, very little effect. Uh, two months later, well, maybe it's actually better as an anti-cancer agent than it is as a, it's, 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 it's psychiatric benefits may be minimal, but it's probably a, a great uh, anti-cancer agent. Let's try to avoid that uh, when we go down this road with, 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 with the MPHS, with the other MPHS, I should say. And Jay, why is your, um, your mechanism for uh, I don't know if growing is the proper word for growing the psilocybin, but why is your your methodology more scalable than say growing mushrooms, growing mushrooms? Um, it's 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 kind of like making beer, you know. Uh, you to actually grow the mushrooms, um, you have to do transfers to substrate, take the time to let that substrate grow out. There's multiple different points along the way where contamination could mess that up. And then what you get at the end isn't always um, consistent. There's differences from mushroom to mushroom depending on what stage of the life cycle, you know, whether it's just a tiny baby mushroom or fully grown out. So uh, at the end of the day, you're still gonna have to take those mushrooms and homogenize them and make an extract out of it. Whereas what we're doing is, uh, you know, just growing out the mycelium and extracting that. So you can scale it up in, in the big tank, just like you know, going from home brewing to a giant brew house. You just get bigger tanks and bigger equipment. Um, so yeah, it's 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 easier to scale up and keep sterile. Just so you think that you're going to be able to do this on a on a mass scale quickly? Oh yes, absolutely. How quickly and how big? Oh, okay. <laughs> I want to know. Okay. You know, there's more than 100 million people around the globe with treatment resistant depression. So if we're waiting for every single mushroom to pop out of the mud, it's going to take a while. Give us the money. The thing is, let's be absolutely clear. We are back of the yard LB sciences. Our business is primarily making sustainable media and growth factors and fecal bovine serum replacements. Okay, because we believe that that's the only way that we'll be able to supply the planet with meat in a non-polluting, non-cruel way. Right. So 
The point is that what we found is that in all these sectors, such as lab-grown meat, and probably in the whole in the whole uh, epigenetic mushroom space, is there there is so little innovation going on that we have to jump in into the whole thing. In order for us to create a market for our growth media, we're going to have to grow, show people how to grow like lots of mushrooms. The problem with that is it takes a, it doesn't take a shitload of money, but it does take money, okay, to do that. Especially if you're going to do it well, we we have a. a, a Three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars just invested in analytical equipment at the moment. That's to do it well, okay? To transition this thing from that black hole where people say we've got the mushroom and we're doing the clinical trial to we've got this mushroom. This is what it contains. This is this, this is its exact. I want to see the the proteomic profile of a mushroom that goes into me if I'm a, if I'm if I'm going to be in a clinical trial. I want to see that gel electrophoresis. Where is it? Okay, I want to see the MSDS from the, from, from the supplier. I want to see the certificate of analysis. That's the way you do research. Um, so you talked a little bit before about the decriminalization movements as well as the federal research. And I know that um, a big concern among longtime psychedelic advocates, people who have been in this space for decades and decades, um, are that Basically, new players are going to come into the space, and psychedelic medicine isn't going to be accessible or, or equitable once it gets to market. So, what are your thoughts on, you know, how the psychedelic industry can basically not make the same mistakes that the cannabis industry made, and, and kind of squashing out the long-time players, the farmers of Humboldt, and the people who have been around forever? And I mean, what, what what can we do to? You know, bring the capital that's necessary into this space to allow it to scale, to allow these things to get to market, while making sure that the people who have been doing this for a long time have a say as well. It's, it's a big challenge. Um, you know, it, it's a delicate balance because we need capital for this industry to grow. We need capital for the research projects that you're describing. As a federal on drug, research is incredibly expensive. We really need to focus on lobbying efforts to get it rescheduled, if not rescheduled. I know that the Johns Hopkins study, <coughs> they're trying to make it schedule four. You know, a lot of farmers and advocates would say that's not good enough. Um, so I think, going back to what I was saying before, is you know, let's not talk about this as another green rush. Let's talk about it as this is a safe, effective, potential medicine that's going to heal a lot of people. Um, and you know, we have a real opportunity to potentially cure treatment-resistant diseases, um, resolve crime, resolve suicide, resolve you know, issues that are increasingly plaguing our society. Um, so if we focus it in terms of a, you know, really a utilitarian perspective, you know, we, we attract the right people. Uh, we don't talk about it in terms of making money, we talk about it in terms of helping and healing. Um, and that's how, you know, what you start thinking about who your prospective partners are and can be synthetic when um, you talk about priorities. Uh, there's no question that the cannabis industry attracts its fair share of charlatans and snake oil salesmen because they were stepping into a multi-billion dollar recreational demand. You know, psilocybin doesn't have that. It does have a multi-billion dollar medical demand, and that's what we should all be focusing on. Um, you know, so this isn't a drug, you know, where people are, you know, taking to the streets and, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't affect the, the, quite the same population numbers as it does with cannabis, uh, but it certainly could surpass that when you're thinking about the potential medical applications. Um, so the investment is real, but you have to be in it for the right reasons, and that's to heal people, and that's where the money will follow. Um, I think that's, you know, and I, I work a lot with the, the farmers out in Humboldt, and um, so much of legalization is, is advocacy. If you're in the business of cannabis, you're in the business of regulatory compliance and advocacy, and it's the same for any kind of psychedelics. You know, we have to shift the stigma. We have to make sure that people understand that this is safe. You know, schedule one is completely inappropriate for this type of medical application. And that's the message that we need to be sending, and that's how we're going to attract the right people. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, in terms of investment opportunities, like what what are people what are people talking to you about? It, as you referenced, you know, psilocybin and psychedelics are very different from cannabis because you can't. I mean, you can just do psilocybin and walk out your door, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, <laughs> really, uh, you know. There has been some talk about whether the decriminalization of psilocybin in Denver and, and other cities and counties is going to allow for some kind of, you know, gray market dispensaries to pop up the way that they did in California after uh, after cannabis was decriminalized in the 90s. Um, but 
you know, it's, it's really, it's a very, very different kind of plant, or fungi rather, and it's a very different kind of experience. So, so what do we make of that? Well, make no mistake, there are side effects to psilocybin and tripping, you know, nausea, disorientation, lack of coordination, sometimes overdose. These things really do happen. Um, and, you know, cannabis, no one has ever, you know, been seriously injured. Um, we'll put aside intoxicating and driving, but um, in terms of cannabis use, it's never killed anyone in the thousands of years of medical application. And it's all side with my understanding on mushrooms is the least frequented ER visit, is my understanding. So it is safe, but at the same time, it does reserve a, a stable and comfortable environment within which to experiment with it. So there are some differences between the safety and you know the widespread use and ability for people to use it, you know, as opposed to microdosing or whatever that might be. Um, but at the same time, you know, like I said, it, that when you when you think about the large swaths of the population that um, you know you have the potential to heal, um, then that's when you really get excited. Uh, we have to follow right now, we have to follow the Schedule One protocols for research. So this investment in research, this investment opportunities, you know, it's less of, think of less of an investment as more of an opportunity to build the market into which you'll ultimately be stepping. So supporting the organizations that are doing the research, like Max and Johns Hopkins and you know the organizations that are doing those research and getting out there and connecting with those organizations to find out who's connecting with them, who's trying to submit studies, um, because grants um, research applications for Schedule One substances can take a long time. Finding a lab to do manufacturing that's Schedule One uh, registered, Schedule One certified takes a long time. Contract manufacturing in general is a tough deal to strike with a manufacturer. Um, so lots of different opportunities exist, keeping in mind it's a long term play, but right now we need to focus on the research uh, and then we'll follow. That leads uh, me into my next question perfectly. So. Uh, you know, obviously, you, you were referencing before some of the challenges to getting approved to dealing on the manufacturing side of Schedule One substances. Um, what, um, you know, why do you think that, or talk to me a little bit about why your methodology you think is going to, is more likely to pass the smell test for GMP uh, with the DEA? Well, I must be frank. I'm as I said, we're not experts on, on, on this particular subject. I mean, we, 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 we work to provide the tools to ensure that there is a widespread, that there will in the future, in the near future, be a widespread safe supply of uh, anti-engine. Uh, and we believe that the way to do that is through cell, cellular agriculture, because that way you never, ever have a fully grown mushroom. And uh, already that, that in itself is, is, is a tremendous advance from a safety point of view, from a good manufacturing point of view. Um, we would, we would, a lot of what we, what, a lot of what I'm saying has been, is, is guided by our experience in the lab grown meat industry, where uh, basically even today, uh, almost, you know, almost, uh, a decade after the first uh, after the first lab grown meat burger was eaten, this, you still can't get another one. <laughs> okay, it's an industry which has got a, a huge amount of hype. It's going to have its Theranos moments, that's for sure. And what you see is that essentially the technology has largely lagged behind the hype. Uh, and uh, that means that if we are working essentially on things like using anaerobic digestase to make non-polluting media, using, uh, using algal extracts to make replacements for uh, dead fetuses which are used to grow vegan meat. Uh, what we want is we want to see an industry that flourishes, okay, where we have uh, not, not tens of thousands of liters of bioreactors, but we have millions upon millions and upon millions of liters of bioreactors. Um, so our role is in this industry the same thing. We have to do this R&D and we have to develop cellular agriculture, but our hope is that, uh, well, if we have to be the world's biggest growers of, 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 of hallucinogenic mushrooms, it's good, we'll, we'll get rich and our investors will get rich, it's great, you know. But it's not really what we, what we want, what, what, what we're about. We're about the enabling technologies and the engineering that goes be, be behind it. But if you want to invest in us to grow a lot of mushrooms, come and see me afterwards. <laughs>